You're listening to Convenience Matters, brought to you by Nax. We'll talk about what we see at stores and what the future may hold for our industry. A year ago, everything was in turmoil. Inflation was at a 40-year high, gas prices were climbing, and they were getting closer to the record that they hit in June. And then we had the supply chain, labor market, all messes. So here we are a year later, things are better, but for how long? We're going to talk about the economy, what it means to you and your business. Joining us today is John Benson. He is partner with Alex Partners and spoke at our NAC State of the Industry Summit that we held in April and um, very, very well received. And we thought it was really appropriate to have John on the podcast and talk a little bit more about uh, what he sees in the um, economic realm over the next 12 months and beyond. So welcome, John. Thanks, Jeff. Great to be here. So I set up by talking about how 2022, this time last year, a lot of things were not looking good. Uh, Here we are a year later. And by the way, you spoke at last year's uh, State of the Industry as well. So what's the difference between 22 and 23 in terms of big picture? So so it's a great question. I think um, a lot of the a lot of the things are similar, right? A lot of the challenges that we see out there that um, for consumers and for businesses are similar. We're still talking about inflation. We're still talking about a tight labor market. You know, we're still talking about uncertainty around you know interest rates and things like that. Um, I would say that one of the big differences is that we're further along in these challenges, right? And we know a lot more about um, how uh, businesses, governments, consumers are going to address them. And, you know, know a lot more about the, their resiliency. So I think, you know, as I thought about uh, 2022, April 2022, there was just a lot more uncertainty. I think the challenges in, at this time now, a year later, are similar, but we just know a lot more. We know the consumers, you know, been a lot more resilient. And that's been great news. Like I said, I, uh, down in Dallas, in my mind, that was the big surprise of 2022. Um, and we know that, you know, how aggressive the Fed is going to be in, in, rising, in raising interest rates to try to combat inflation. Um, so I think now it's a, a not a matter of there's all these headwinds. What's going to happen? How are people going to respond? We know how people responded. People in businesses and governments responded. But now it's a, OK, what's the response to the response? Right. Mm-hmm. What happens next? Um, because there's been a lot of changes, a lot of activity happening over the past year. So so kind of what comes next, I think, is, is a big uh, is a big change. The response to the response is, is I think. A fascinating way to look at things. And I mean, it, we, we've gone through all these exercises, I'm sure everybody has, where you just look at those kind of scenarios where, you know, what happens if this happens? Well, this leads to this. And that's where you maybe find some opportunity or some threats down the road. And, um, you know, it's impossible to predict what the future may hold. You just try to get the best sense you can in terms of this feels similar to something that happened in the past and the past tends to repeat itself. So um, are, are there any indicators when you look at the economy um, where, where you say this time it's different, you know, in 200 years of economic analysis and all that is it, are there moments and, and what drives those moments where you might see something and say, this is different this time. So I, I think it's a great question. I think, you know, the big picture, thinking about, you know, the, the long term, um, it's hard to say. But if we think about the, you know, over the past couple of years, what makes this moment in time different, I think a lot of it is related to the consumer. And so if we think about through the all of the challenges that consumers face over the past couple of years, and they've been enormous, right? I mean, the, the pandemic has been happening, uh, the huge changes in the labor market and how people just work, uh, transitions uh, for everybody on both a, a, a professional and, and personal level. So the consumer has been through the, the ringer uh, in, in a lot of different ways. Um, but now it's different um, in the sense that the, um, the support system, if you will, or the, uh, the consumer was buoyed for so long by you know, um, a pandemic stimulus and tax cuts and even cha- changes into the tax code. You know, one of the things I thought was interesting uh, on this, this, uh, this uh, tax cycle year they just we get, uh, came through with with taxes being due this uh, this past April. Um, returns are at their their lowest uh, rate in years. Uh, so people are getting less money in terms of their tax returns. A lot of these uh, changes to the tax code th- through the pandemic, the changes to the child uh, earned income tax credit, et cetera. A lot of those are being phased out. 
So the consumer basically is losing some of that buoy that they've had from the government uh, over time. Business is the same thing. You know, there's there's no um, there's less support coming from the government now than there was during the pandemic. And as I look at things and as I look at you know the situation in Washington and the some of the political gridlock, I don't see you know more stimulus coming uh, either for businesses or for consumers. Um, you know, anytime soon. So I think that is a big thing that's different is, and that's the big question right now is how is the consumer going to stand up when they still are faced with a lot of these challenges, but they're going to have less of the support um, from, from governments and businesses the same way. Not only that, but one of the lines that you said was we have a consumer who's not feeling so hot. And that absolutely echoes everything that Nax has found in our consumer surveys. Uh, the April issue of Nax magazine, the cover story, was titled How to Sell Fuel to People in a Bad Mood. Um, there, there's a lot of unease. And, and you have said that in many cases, or in most cases, the consumer ultimately determines where the economy is going. But it feels a little different. There, there's, a, there's way more angst. And, and as you said, they're not feeling so hot. No, I think it's a great point. And yeah, we, we talked about in, in Dallas, we talked about um, one of the data points that we cover. We, we um, survey consumers. And since the beginning of the pandemic, and actually a little bit before that, we've been surveying them, asking about how they're feeling about their financial uh, health, how they're feeling about their physical health, um, uh, et cetera. And we basically are trying to get a sense of what is the consumer, you know, where's their head at right now? And uh, we showed it in Dallas, but um, when we do it uh, biannually, so uh, twice a year, uh, so semi-annually, excuse me, so twice Mm -hmm. a year, um, we do it twice a year, and uh, looking at the last read that we had at the very end of 2022, compared to where things were throughout 20 throughout 2022, and in, in, in our May read, you know, you saw a significant jump. It went from 34 percent to 41 percent of consumers saying that they are are very or extremely concerned about their financial health. So that's a big jump. It's a uh, it's a significant jump in just that that end of the of 2022. And I suspect it's going to be a few more months before we do this again, but I suspect that that number is only going to continue to climb. And I think, you know, what that translates to is, yes, a, a very um, uh, a very cautious consumer, a consumer that's going to get a lot more um, deliberate on where they want to spend their money. And I think we're all seeing it. And I think we're seeing it in our, in our own personal lives as well, where everyone's just getting a little bit more conservative. And what that means for businesses is that your consumer is going to be a lot more picky. They're going to be a lot more you know, difficult to, to woo, uh, consumers are going to be more selective in, in where they decide to spend their dollars. So there's still what the, the survey data that we've seen. And when we talk to consumers and when we talk to businesses as well, what, what we're seeing is a consumer is still willing to spend. They're just going to be a lot more particular about where that spending happens. And so businesses need to get a lot better at, at being the, the, the place of choice, right? There's a lot of options out there for discretionary spending. There will still continue to be uh, decent consumer spending out there, but it's going to be harder to kind of capture. So that's what's going to be, I think, more challenging for businesses going forward. And that comes down to value. And and that doesn't necessarily mean a, a three for one or something like that, you know, a meal deal or something like that. But, but it's really why should, I guess it's two things. Why should somebody spend money, period, because convenience stores, we sell we sell impulse, we sell immediate consumption. So the first thing you need to get over the hurdle is why buy something? And then, of course, the second, buy it from me, not from somebody else that sells that same product. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. What I would add is it's, it comes down to value and it comes down to differentiation. So how is your offering uh, differentiated uh, um, against competition? And that could be other convenience stores or that could be you know, dollar stores, uh, grocery stores, other retailers. So that's uh, having that differentiated product offering, I think, is key. And um, the thing is, is that, like I said, consumers will still spend. They're still going to be making trips, but they're going to be making probably fewer trips. And the key for businesses is going to be how do you get them into your door, first of all? And then once they're there, how do you optimize you know, their basket size? How do you make sure that they are you know, buying the products that, uh, buying the products that are, are driving the most profitability for you? How are you making sure that you're priced right, that your merchandising strategy is correct? So that you're meeting that consumer's needs and you're optimizing essentially uh, their basket when you get them in the get them in the door. So, whether your data uh, informs on this, uh, sometimes what we do is we ask other folks. We we say, hey, you know, we have this guy on, and um, a lot of interesting things to talk about. Do you have any questions that you'd like to ask? So I did get one. Uh, somebody had asked, um, "How does all of this affect lottery?" Uh, you know, 
with with consumers sometimes looking at lottery as a way to get out of a situation or um, you know might it be down because of impulse because people are uh, tighter with that buck or two or whatever that they want to spend um, any insight into that like I said we we always like the listener questions so I thought I'd throw it out there no it's a great one I think um I think to, so first, we don't have any specific uh, consumer data that would point to this is going to happen with lottery or this is this or that is going to happen. But I would say um, two things. I think all categories uh, on inside sales are going to are going to face the same level of, of scrutiny that we've been talking about. So I would suspect that um, there's going to be it's going to take a hit just like everything else. Um, to your point, you know, are, do do people see it as a as a, uh, you know, as, as a counter cyclical uh, category where when things actually get tighter, they, you know, they put some more faith in, in that category. Or they want to spend more dollars there potentially. Um, but from my standpoint, I would guess that we're going to continue to see the same type of pressure on, on lottery as we we're going to see on, on most you know, categories and uh, across all of inside sales. Now, you also uh, look at industries overall, uh, channel blurring. And yes. you know, the, the effect of when somebody goes to a dollar store, they don't say, I'm going to a dollar store. When somebody goes to a convenience store, they don't say, I'm going to a convenience store, et cetera. They go to solve their problems. So that makes things a lot more difficult when, when your competition is not within the channel. It's literally everyone who sells convenience and everyone sells convenience. Right. So – what are ways that somebody might be able to differentiate themselves, not just within the channel, but beyond the channel? So I think there's a couple things that it's so a channel blurns. It definitely has been a topic over the you know, past several years or, or you know, call it five to 10 years, really, that um, that we've been thinking and talking with businesses about. You know, it really started um, with convenience stores uh, going more into food service. So at least for me, that's when when it became you know, very apparent. So, and you had all sorts of QSRs. You had, uh, I believe it was a CEO of Dunkin' Donuts. Now, this was years ago. This was, might have been five, 10 years ago, but saying that, you know, that that, um, that that person viewed C stores as one of the biggest competitive threats. And so, it kind of started with C stores, you know, bringing in the competition and, and, and blurring the channels with restaurants. And then, obviously, there's been a lot more of that across the board. Uh, um, um, dollar stores have been a huge um, competitive threat for for not just convenience, but a lot of industries across uh, uh, retail. And so I think you know the channel burn is definitely uh, definitely a topic and, and a challenge and opportunity uh, for for companies across each of these different channels. Now I would say convenience stores are in some ways very well positioned to compete in this blurred space uh, competitive environment. The fact that convenience stores succeed on multiple customer occasions, especially in this situation where we have a consumer who's going to want to be decreasing the number of trips, trying to be more um, uh, uh, um, deliberate in terms of where they're spending their dollars. The fact that convenience stores can hit on really the big three from fuel, food service and, and, and retail merchandise, I think is, is really a, a natural advantage for uh, convenience stores. So obviously, um, you know, restaurants don't have that. Um, they have, you know, really strong offering on the food service, but not necessarily as much on uh, mm-hmm. or anything really on fuel or, or merchandise. Dollar stores are, are great on merchandise or great on value, but they're starting to get more into food service. And a lot of them are trying to, to uh, compete and differentiate themselves that way. But, you know, there's very few that, that are doing a lot in the fuel space. So I think the convenience stores um, need to, uh, to lean in on that, in that advantage. Now, the making their offering on say food service uh, really competitive, I think is is a key part of that. So if you think about just you know the again getting the head of the consumer, why am I making a trip? Why am I making a stop? If it's part of that that breakfast routine, making sure you have a really strong uh, food service offering for the for the morning and the breakfast day part, I think is, is a really important. And for me, I'm a big coffee drinker. You know, how is what does your coffee program look like? Is it differentiated? Is it do you have a premium um, uh, coffee program out there that's going to attract uh, attract consumers to to say, hey, I'm going to stop here specifically because their coffee is great. They've got some great, you know, um, uh, uh, bakery selections and, and I'm going to stop here to, you know, to fuel up and, and get some of the food service at the same time. So I think things like that are going to be really important premiumizing, having a differentiated um, food service uh, offering, I think is, is a great place to start. 
Yeah, and and you can totally see that in, in whether it's the Home Depot selling snacks at the register, um, PetSmart, um, auto parts stores. They you're not going to see a um, a chef uh, working PetSmart or right. you know, Track Auto or something like that. So it does allow some differentiation in that convenience space. And um, you know, the other thing that that you talked about um, was the idea that that. To compete in our industry, we're going to see a lot more M and A. Uh, the big will get bigger because, well, you know, for one reason, uh, if you have a couple hundred stores and you're competing against Dollar General and they have ten thousand stores, you know, you you have to not just compete with the store down the street, uh, the convenience store down the street, but it's Dollar General everywhere. And before the next, before some people even got home from the SOI summit, your um, discussion about how m a is going to ramp, ramp up already came true because maverick maverick acquired come and go and a week later mapgo express um gets split between two acquirers so um let's call you nostradamus on that because um you certainly um hit that that m a is ramping up and and i would imagine that we're not done there no, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and, you know, Chuck did a great job in Dallas of, you know, uh, maintaining being tight lipped uh, on the on the Maverick and come and go deal. I, I think that was really exciting uh, when I when I saw that announced. Um, I think, you know, two uh, two great brands, two great footprints. Uh, and I think a lot of uh, complementary complimentary nature uh, between those two businesses. So I'm excited to see what's in store for uh, for those businesses. But you're right. I mean, there's a, there's a lot. You mentioned two very recent ones. Um, but you know, BP acquired Travel Centers of America earlier uh, in the year. There's been a lot of deals. Um, there's been some huge headline deals over the past couple of years. Um, thinking of 7-Eleven and Speedway, et cetera. But there's just a ton. You know, it's it's I I, I follow the convenience store industry pretty closely, and and uh, you know, and read the the news media uh, for convenience stores all the time. And it almost seems like every day, or at least certainly every week, there's some deal, even if it's just a smaller uh, transaction. There's some uh, M and A activity happening in the industry. I think it's it makes sense to me. I mean, I think the longer term trends that we've talked about, you hit on some of them. Uh, they all require you know companies to be you know well capitalized, uh, have capital to make investments, um, you know, have strong brands, and be able to invest dollars to support those brands. Have things like loyalty programs. None of this is is really necessarily that easy to do. None of it's really that cheap to do. But it's becoming more and more of a requirement or a table stake for for companies to do well. In order to compete in the space and not just when I say the space, not just what we were, were talking about, not just the convenience store space, but this channel blurred space of of really just uh, of convenience retail and, and things like that. Um, so I think it's basically makes a lot of sense to me. And I think uh, companies are doing it for um, to acquire scale, to be able to support investments uh, that they need to make to to, to differentiate their companies. Um, we look at uh, the longer term trends on the convenience stores. And obviously, you know, there had been a D uh, with the next data is, is, my, is my source for the number of um, convenience stores in the industry. And over the past, you know, I think four or five years, it had slowly been declining. We saw that yes. reverse a little bit uh, over the past year, which was great to see. But uh, at the same time, we look at the concentration at the top. You know, what you know, what is that those top? Uh, what is the percentage of, of convenience stores overall that are um, that are owned by these leading brands and that continues to grow and we've got some charts on that actually I think I included one in the presentation in Dallas but that continues to grow so there's more and more concentration at the top which it, to me is is exciting it, it creates a lot of opportunities for companies out there um, but I can I expect to, that we'll continue to see that so you you referenced Chuck Chuck Maglet who was the master of ceremonies for the NAC State Industry Summit and you had no, he was CEO of Maverick. He had no idea that he was going through all this, um, and, and you know the work that took place once he got off stage uh, was probably phenomenal. Now, uh, for those that listen to the podcast, we we did one a couple years ago with Chuck, and interestingly, we had somebody else on the podcast with him, and that was Tanner Kraus, CEO of uh, Come and Go. So. We put them in a room. We had a podcast with them. I don't know what role that played in anything. Um, can always can always dream that we played a role in all that. But if you want to go listen to that, just just type uh, Tanner or uh, Chuck's name in the 
the search and you can find that episode and maybe there's some hints there who knows I think you should take a little bit of credit, Jeff. I, I agree with that. Uh, I agree with that theory. Um, it's, it's a good yeah. one. Well, if somebody doesn't like the the merger, yell at me. If if you like the merger, I'm sure it's not me. So, um, but anyway, it just it just was kind of funny when I was thinking, wow, we had both of them on. Exactly. So, um, we'll we'll kind of wrap in in looking at the big question everybody's asking uh, in terms of the economy: recession or no recession. Um, are we going to have one? Are we in one? And what does it all mean? So you've picked some things that uh, were eerily accurate days or hours after. Uh, where are we in, in terms of a recession? So the, the textbook definition of a recession, two, two quarters, consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth, um, to me, by that textbook definition, we're not in a recession today. Uh, the first quarter GDP came out at 1.1% for the U.S. Obviously, that was a decline or de- is a smaller number than, than the previous quarter in Q4 uh, 2022. So technically, by the textbook definition, not yet, right? I think most economists uh, um, uh, put the um, uh, uh, chances or the probability of a recession sometime this year at about you know 70%, something in that range. But you know we're we're dealing in, in the in the uh, the art of economic uh, forecasting, which is you know definitely more of an art than a science, and and, and a, a dangerous art at that because it's you know you're you're more likely to be wrong than anything else. But I would say, as I think about it, I almost think that um, there's that question of the official kind of you know technical mm-hmm. definitions around a recession and things like that. I personally look at it and I say, you know. Uh, how are consumers feeling? How are businesses feeling? And how are they responding? And how are they acting? And I think by that definition, we're certainly in a era or a period of, of greater concern. So even if it's not technically a recession right now, even if it's not, uh, even if it won't be until later in the year, uh, I think the consumers and businesses are already starting to make some of those actions as if we were, or certainly as if we're going into that uh, a period of, of recession or a period of, of slight downturn. I don't think it's, uh, from my standpoint, like I said, it's difficult to predict these things, so I, I hesitate to even even say it, but I think likely what it will be is a more of a minor recession or a recession that comes in waves in certain channels or certain certain industries uh, at different times. So it's not going to be, I don't think, a repeat of 2008 by any means, but um, it certainly, I think, will be a challenging uh, rest of the year for 2023 and likely you know, a challenging uh, time for the beginning of 2024 as well. Um, so in my mind, that that's the best I can do in terms of any kind of prediction. We'll see if I'm if I'm right. I hope that I am, um, just for my own personal pride. Um, but uh, but I do think that we are we'll see. Uh, more importantly, it's what's what are consumers doing, what are businesses doing, and we already see them doing it. There's a lot of businesses who are taking a really close look at their cost structures and saying, you know, is now the time and trying to gird themselves for a recession. Right? I think I ended the. Um, I ended the the session down in Dallas with um, the best advice I could give is, you know, hope, uh, plan for the worst, hope for the best. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what a lot of businesses are doing. So right now, businesses are saying, you know, what does my uh, G&A cost structure look like? You know, is now the time to to, to reevaluate that? Do we have the right people doing the right things? I think they're looking at things like their third party spend and looking at procurement and saying, okay, you know, do I have the right uh, partners, the right supply partners? Do I have competitive pricing uh, with those partners? Is now the time to, 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 to market test? I would make the argument that it's probably past the time, you know, with some of the things that we saw happening with commodities and input costs. If you haven't already started really pressure testing your, your supply base and, and looking for opportunities in your third party spend, now is definitely the time to do it. Um, so businesses are looking at those areas. They're, they're trying to strengthen their balance sheets. They're, they're um, trying to, to, uh, to strengthen their P&Ls and become more profitable and protect, you know, gird their business, protect their businesses for a potential uh, decline in, uh, in trips, a potential decline in consumer spending. And I think on the consumer side, like we talked about at the beginning, they're getting conservative as well. Um, and so I think, you know, both businesses and consumers are basically girding for the recession. So in my mind, um, we can almost answer it now that mm-hmm. it's the downturn has sort of started to happen in terms of behaviors. So that, that's sort of how I look at it. Yeah. And, and I guess most people don't read the Wall Street Journal or something like that. It's like if they feel it, exactly. it's real. Right. And, you know, there, there's a sense that, that they might feel it. And then, then it probably accelerates from there where uh, they heard a friend just got laid off or you know, a neighbor or something like that. 
and and that would ultimately drive you know, how consumer sen- consumer sentiment and then ultimately what they do. So uh, sounds like the best advice is to to lay things out, to be ready for anything, and and also I guess be nimble. I think that's right. And the one thing I would add, Jeff, um, is that we, we talk a lot about the risks. We talk about potential recession and, and what that means. I'm still extremely bullish on, on the convenience store space. And I still think that re- even in if there is a downturn and, and consumer uh, behavior changes a bit, I still think that that presents not just a challenge for businesses, but great opportunity. You know, there certainly will be winners and losers you know, over, the, over the next 12 months and beyond. And I think, you know, the companies that can really take on these challenges head on, the companies can, who can really think about how they're differentiating their products, like we talked about, how they're connecting with their consumers, how they're building their brand, uh, and to make the, their companies the places where consumers want to spend those reduced discretionary dollars. I think, you know, there's a great opportunity to win more share in this space. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, and not just, like we said, against convenience stores, but against restaurants and other retailers. So I think, if I'm in in a the shoes of uh, of a C store you know management team right now, I'm 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 getting cautious. I'm being very deliberate on how I'm planning for the future, but I'm also seeing you know a, a great a great amount of opportunity as well. Well, John, thank you for joining us today and um, for presenting each of the last two years at our State of the Industry Summit. You can read about um, all the coverage of the State of the Industry Summit in the June issue of Max Magazine, including a feature on John's presentation. So uh, once again, John, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Jeff. It was great to be here. And thank you all for listening to Convenience Matters. Convenience Matters is brought to you by Nax and produced in partnership with Human Factor. For more information, visit convenience.org.